This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain, and for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 3 The Adoption. The master woodsman suddenly rose with knitted brows. There is a strange presence in the forest, he declared. Then the queen and her nymphs turned and saw standing before them Nisil, with the sleeping infant clasped tightly in her arms and a defiant look in her deep blue eyes. And thus for a moment they remained, the nymphs filled with surprise and consternation but the brow of the master woodsman gradually clearing as he gazed intently upon the beautiful immortal who had willfully broken the law. Then the great Ack, to the wonder of all, laid his hand softly on Nisil's flowing locks and kissed her on her fair forehead. For the first time within my knowledge, said he gently, a nymph has defied me and my laws. Yet in my heart I can find no word of chiding. What is your desire, Nasil? Let me keep the child, she answered, beginning to tremble and falling on her knees in supplication. Here in the forest of Burzee, where the human race has never yet penetrated? questioned Ak. Here in the forest of Burzee, replied the nymph boldly. It is my home, and I am weary for lack of occupation. Let me care for the babe. See how weak and helpless it is. Surely it cannot harm Burzee nor the master woodsman of the world. But the law, child, the law, cried Ack sternly. The law is made by the master woodsman, returned Nisil. If he bids me care for the babe, he himself has saved from death. Who in all the world dare oppose me? Queen Zerline, who had listened intently to this conversation, clapped her pretty hands gleefully at the nymph's answer. You are fairly trapped, O oh Ack, she exclaimed, laughing. Now, I pray you, give heed to Nasil's petition. The woodsman, as was his habit when then thought, stroked his grizzled beard slowly. Then he said, she shall keep the babe, and I will give it my protection. But I warn you all that as this is the first time I have relaxed the law, so shall it be the last time. Nevermore, to the end of the world, shall a mortal be adopted by an immortal. Otherwise, would we abandon our happy existence for one of trouble and anxiety. Good night, my nymphs. Then Ak was gone from their midst and the seal hurried away to her bower to rejoice over her newfound treasure. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Claws Another day found Nasil's bower the most popular place in the forest. The nymphs clustered around her and the child that lay asleep in her lap, with expressions of curiosity and delight nor were they wanting in praises for the great Ack's kindness in allowing Nasil to keep the babe, and to care for it. Even the queen came to peer into the innocent childish face, and to hold a helpless chubby fist in her own fair hand. "'What shall we call him, Nasil?' she asked, smiling. "'He must have a name, you know.' "'Let him be called Claus,' answered Nasil for that means a little one. Rather let him be called Nicklaus. Begin footnote. Some people have spelled this name Nicklaus, and others Nicholas, which is the reason that Santa Claus is still known in some lands as Saint Nicholas. But of course Nicklaus is his right name, and Claus the nickname given him by his adopted mother, the fair nymph Nasil. End footnote. Rather let him be called Nicklaus, returned the queen, 
for that will mean Nesil's little one. The nymphs clapped their hands in delight, and Neclaus became the infant's name, although Nesil loved best to call him Claus, and in after days many of her sisters followed her example. Nesil gathered the softest moss in all the forest for Claus to lie upon, and she made his bed in her own bower. Of food the infant had no lack. The nymphs search the forest for bell udders which grow upon the go tree, and when opened are found to be filled with sweet milk, and the soft-eyed does willingly gave a share of their milk to support the little stranger, while Shiegra the lioness often crept stealthily into Nesil's bower and purred softly as she lay beside the babe and fed it. So the little one flourished and grew big and sturdy day by day, while Nesil taught him to speak and to walk and to play. His thoughts and words were sweet and gentle, for the nymphs knew no evil and their hearts were pure and loving. He became the pet of the forest, for Axe decree had forbidden beast or reptile to molest him and he walked fearlessly wherever his will guided him. Presently the news reached the other immortals that the nymphs of Burzi had adopted a human infant, and that the act had been sanctioned by the great Ack. Therefore many of them came to visit the little stranger, looking upon him with much interest. First the Rills, who are first cousins to the wood nymphs, although so differently formed for the rills are required to watch over the flowers and plants, as the nymphs watch over the forest trees. They search the wide world for the food required by the roots of the flowering plants, while the brilliant colors possessed by the full-blown flowers are due to the dyes placed in the soil by the rills, which are drawn through the little veins in the roots and the body of the plants as they reach maturity. The rills are a busy people, for their flowers bloom and fade continually but they are merry and light-hearted, and are very popular with the other immortals. Next came the Nooks, whose duty it is to watch over the beasts of the world, both gentle and wild. The Nooks have a hard time of it, since many of the beasts are ungovernable, and rebel against restraint. But they know how to manage them after all, and you will find that certain laws of the Nooks are obeyed by even the most ferocious animals. Their anxieties make the nooks look old and worn and crooked, and their natures are a bit rough from associating with wild creatures continually. Yet they are most useful to humanity and to the world in general, as their laws are the only laws the forest beasts recognize, except those of the master woodsman. Then there were the fairies, the guardians of mankind, who were much interested in the adoption of claws because their own laws forbade them to become familiar with their human charges. There are instances on record where the fairies have shown themselves to human beings, and have even conversed with them. But they are supposed to guard the lives of mankind, unseen and unknown, and if they favor some people more than others, it is because they have won such distinction fairly, as the fairies are very just and impartial. But the idea of adopting a child of men had never occurred to them because it was in every way opposed to their laws. So their curiosity was intense to behold the little stranger adopted by Nesil and her sister nymphs. Claus looked upon the immortals who thronged around him with fearless eyes and smiling lips. He rode laughingly upon the shoulders of the merry rills. He mischievously pulled the grey beards of the low-browed nooks. He rested his curly head confidently upon the dainty bosom of the fairy queen herself. And the rills loved the sound of his laughter. The nooks loved his courage. The fairies loved his innocence. The boy made friends of them all, and learned to know their laws intimately. No forest flower was trampled beneath his feet, lest the friendly rill should be grieved. He never interfered with the beasts of the forest, lest his friends the nooks should become angry. The fairies he loved dearly, but knowing nothing of mankind, he could not understand that he was the only one of his race admitted to friendly intercourse with them. Indeed, Claus came to consider that he alone, of all the forest people, had no like nor fellow. To him the forest was the world. 
he had no idea that millions of toiling, striving human creatures existed. And he was happy and content. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Master Woodsman Years passed swiftly in Burzee, for the nymphs had no need to regard time in any way. Even centuries make no change in the dainty creatures. Ever and ever they remain the same, immortal and unchanging. Claus, however, being mortal, grew to manhood day by day. Nasil was disturbed presently to find him too big to lie in her lap, and he had a desire for other food than milk. His stout legs carried him far into Burzee's heart, where he gathered supplies of nuts and berries, as well as several sweet and wholesome roots, which suited his stomach better than the bell-udders. He sought Nasil's bower less frequently, till finally it became his custom to return thither only to sleep. The nymph who had come to love him dearly was puzzled to comprehend the changed nature of her charge, and unconsciously altered her own mode of life to conform to his whims. She followed him readily through the forest paths, as did many of her sister-nymphs, explaining as they walked all the mysteries of the gigantic wood, and the habits and nature of the living things which dwelt beneath its shade. The language of the beasts became clear to little Claus, but he never could understand their sulky and morose tempers. Only the squirrels, the mice, and the rabbits seemed to possess cheerful and merry natures. Yet. Would the boy laugh when the panther growled, and stroke the bear's glossy coat while the creature snarled and bared its teeth menacingly? The growls and snarls were not for claws, he well knew, so what did they matter? He could sing the songs of the bees, recite the poetry of the wood flowers, and relate the history of every blinking owl in Burzee. He helped the rills to feed their plants, and the nooks to keep order among the animals. The little immortals regarded him as a privileged person, being especially protected by Queen Zerline and her nymphs, and favored by the great Ack himself. One day the master woodsman came back to the forest of Burzee. He had visited in turn all his forests throughout the world, and they were many and broad. Not until he entered the glade where the queen and her nymphs were assembled to greet him did Ack remember the child he had permitted Nasil to adopt. Then he found, sitting familiarly in the circle of lovely immortals, a broad-shouldered stalwart youth, who, when erect, stood fully as high as the shoulder of the master himself. Ack paused, silent and frowning, to bend his piercing gaze upon Claus. The clear eyes met his own steadfastly, and the woodsman gave a sigh of relief as he marked their placid depths and read the youth's brave and innocent heart. Nevertheless, as Ack sat beside the fair queen, and the golden chalice filled with rare nectar passed from lip to lip, the master woodsman was strangely silent and reserved, and stroked his beard many times with a thoughtful motion. With morning he called Claus aside, in kindly fashion, saying, Bid good-bye for a time to Nasil and her sisters for you shall accompany me on my journey through the world." The venture pleased Claus, who knew well the honour of being companion of the master woodsman of the world. But Nasil wept for the first time in her life, and clung to the boy's neck as if she could not bear to let him go. The nymph who had mothered this sturdy youth was still as dainty, as charming and beautiful as when she had dared to face Ack with the babe clasped to her breast. Nor was her love less great. Ack beheld the two clinging together, seemingly as brother and sister to one another, and again he wore his thoughtful look. End of chapter 5